Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And um, the story of Missouri's Ozark dinosaurs is a kind of a bizarre one in many ways. For one thing, if there's one place you don't expect people to be finding dinosaurs, it's down in the Ozarks. When you think of dinosaurs, you think of the Western United States, or maybe up into Canada, or maybe Mongolia in China, but the Ozarks. And we wouldn't even know about these dinosaurs except for a happy accident. But before we get to when that happy accident occurred, and let me see if my remote works. And that's just kind of my little title I made up for this topic. If I ever do a book, I think that's what I'm going to call it. Um, we got to travel back in time about 75 million years into the past to the time when the dinosaurs that we find remains of were romping about and doing their thing. The world was a very different place in those days. Uh, this is North America, and it was closer to the equator than it is now. And right up through the central part of what is today the United States and Canada, there was a, a seaway, an inland sea as we call it. Closer view. So the United States was, and Canada were divided into two halves. The eastern part was completely isolated from the western part by the great western interior seaway, which in its deepest parts was about 600 feet deep. And the part that Missouri was part of is called Appalachia. And then the, the dinosaurs you've probably heard about from the United States, almost all of them come from what we call Laramidia, from places like Colorado and Wyoming and Montana and Utah and New Mexico and so forth. Dinosaurs are not so easy to come by in Appalachia, I'm afraid. But Missouri, that's our, that's our spot on the map there. That's where our dinosaur site would, would have been. And notice that the Gulf of Mexico comes all the way up into the southeastern part of our state. So in those days, you didn't have to drive very far south from St. Louis to get to the ocean. Cape Girardeau, would, what is today Cape Girardeau, would have been close to the seashore in those times. Even closer in, so here we see the Gulf of Mexico. And at, at the time our dinosaurs were living, it would have been a little further south than this. This shows the maximum extent that the sea came up uh, just toward the very end of uh, the dinosaur age. And there's our dinosaur site. So this is Bollinger County. This is uh, Cape Girardeau County. Cape Girardeau is right there. Here's St. Louis. So St. Louis would have been in an area similar to the Gulf Coastal Plain of Mississippi or Louisiana or Georgia, southern Georgia. And our dinosaurs were living not far from the sea coast, or not far from the ocean. They were living in a coastal area. And this is a geologic map of our state of Missouri. Again, our dinosaur site is right here. This is what's called the escarpment, which essentially separates the lowlands of the southeastern part of our state and the edge of the Ozarks. And down here, this green color here, this is ocean sediments from the late part of the Cretaceous period. So that's how we know that the ocean used to be up here, is it left behind sediments with all kinds of seashells in them, so various types of uh, extinct sea creatures. But our site, which is right up here, this is the town of Marble Hill right there. This is Missouri 34, Cape Girardeau's over here. Ours is not thought to be an ocean deposit, but fresh water of some kind, or maybe brackish water, slightly salty. And so back, way back 75 million years ago, there was some sort of a lake or maybe a backwater slough of a river that our dinosaurs were living around the edges of. And unfortunately for some of them, they died and their bones got buried and deposited in clay. And in addition to the dinosaurs, lots of turtles. I saw somebody wearing a turtle shirt in here. Turtle fossils are the most common things we find, but they're not mutant ninja turtles, but they are turtles. <laughs> And some of them are pretty bizarre, and they kind of look like mutants. Uh, fishes, crocodiles, and so forth. So it was some kind of a body of uh, presumably fresh to brackish water, and the dinosaur bones got buried in that clay. Now we're going to fast forward 75 million years. Oh, I'm sorry. And in the meantime, the earth cracked, and the section where our lake was got dropped down along what are called faults. So faults are cracks in the earth along which the two sides move. And this side moved up, and the middle part jumped down, and stuff got washed down on top of and, and preserved the clay. Now, 
In 1942, there was a family called the Chronister family. Uh, Lula Chronister was the head of the household, and she had several sons, the youngest of which was named Oli. I think he was about six years old in 1942. And they were digging a well in the back on the other side of the house from that picture. And along came a geologist working for the state survey named Dan Stewart. And that's a picture of him roughly at the same time, so he would have been about that age. He was looking for clay deposits, and this is one of these examples of a happy accident. If he had happened onto their property a year earlier or a year later, we wouldn't know anything about dinosaurs in Missouri. But because he happened onto their property at the exact time they were digging that hole, in fact, the little boy discovered him and said, what you doing, mister? He says, well, I'm looking for clay deposits for the state. And he said, we got some out back to the house. And when Dan went around the back of the house and saw the clay piled up, he noticed some of these sticking out of the clay. These are vertebrae from the tail. And Mistress Lula brought some more out that they had picked out and, uh, on their own. So he asked if he could borrow these, because he knew there was something special about these. These weren't just some old cow bones. Here he is in 1990. He hadn't been back to the site in 50 years, but he came while we were doing one of our early excavations. Eventually, those bones got sent from Missouri to Washington, D.C., to the Smithsonian Institution, where their dinosaur expert, Dr. Charles Gilmore, looked at the bones, and he said, well, I'll be. Those are dinosaur bones. They're from the tail of a dinosaur. No dinosaur remains had ever previously been found from our state. And if, if Dan hadn't come onto that property at exactly the right moment in time, we still wouldn't know about them, because these bones don't wear out on the surface where you can see them. They're still original bone. So Dr. Gilmore and Dan Stewart published a scientific paper on this in 1945. That's the original string of tail vertebrae that were found in the well. And there was a couple other bones, too, but for some reason they didn't get figured in the publication, some pieces of skull. And so these are what are called caudal or tail vertebrae. And then shortly after the paper was published, unfortunately, Dr. Gilmore passed away. And nothing more was done with the site for many, many years. Uh, you would think people would have flocked there and started digging, but no, they didn't. And in the original scientific paper, Dr. Gilmore suggested that the dinosaur may have been related to one of these guys, the sauropod dinosaurs, the largest land animals that have ever lived. Uh, Although, to be fair, in the paper, he allowed us how it might be a duckbill dinosaur. That's a person there for scale. So these are big dinosaurs. And because of the size of the vertebrae, he was thinking that it was this kind of a beastie. Now, fast forward to the 1970s. This is my old historical geology teacher, Dr. Bruce Stinchcomb, who still lives in, over in Ferguson. And uh, he's now retired from Florissant Valley Community College. And he read that paper when he was a student at Rolla, University of Missouri Rolla, and he got intrigued. He wanted to check it out at some point, and he finally did, and he went to find the new property owner, which was Oli. Oli is now a grown man, and uh, he allowed Dr. Stinchcomb to do some test excavations, and then Bruce bought, I think, 60 acres, including the original house and the site where the original dinosaur bones were found. And so Dr. Sinchcomb started a series of excavations in the 70s and 80s, and he, after doing various different test excavations, started finding more bones. And in the late 1980s, 1986, these people got in, involved in the site, and they're from the New Jersey State Museum, or at least were, she's now a University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School, but he's still a uh, curator at the New Jersey State Museum. They have a similar deposit in New Jersey, so they were intrigued by it, and so they got in on the act, too, and they've, they've been some of our dinosaur experts that we've consulted with. Now, what did Dr. Sinchcomb find? I'm just going to show you a few of the things that his excavations revealed about the Missouri dinosaur. He found more parts of the tail of the beastie. So that's I've got some casts here, some replicas of some tail vertebrae. That, so this one's very similar to the one in the picture. And something interesting about this, see this mark? 
that's where apparently a tooth raked across there. Could have been a crocodile, could have been a meat-eating dinosaur, and it was, I, you know, I don't know whether it was from being the animal that actually killed this dinosaur or whether it was being scavenged, but that's evidence of uh, it was being fed upon at any rate. So that's kind of intriguing. Another bone that they found is from right behind the skull. What attaches the spinal column to the skull is called the atlas axis complex. And this is the atlas bone. Now your atlas bone is probably no bigger than about like that. This thing is about that wide. So it's a big animal. That's a, that's a finger bone. And these are in centimeters. So again, way bigger than any bones in your fingers. And these are among my absolute favorite fossils that have ever been found there. These are toe bones. And that's my hand there for scale. So that one toe is bigger than my entire foot. And it also shows evidence of osteoarthritis, according to a guy who studies such things, Dr. Uh, Bruce Rothschild. So it's one of the few examples, I think he said it's one of only four examples he's ever seen in the entire world of bona fide osteoarthritis. So our poor dinosaur might have been kind of limping along, maybe had a walker. <laughs> so I call him Granddaddy Hadrosaur. This is a bit of a cheat. He, although they are all toe bones, they're not all from the same toe. They're, each one is, they're all from the same foot, but not from the same toe. But I, that, if they were from the same toe, that'd be how they'd be lined up. This is the tip of the toe. That'd be the part next to the foot. So Dr. Paris, after looking at all these different new fossils, he said, uh -uh -uh, it's not a sauropod. It's not one of those long-necked, long-tailed Sinclair dinosaurs. This is a duckbill dinosaur, a hadrosaur, one of the most successful groups of dinosaurs of all time. So our, our beast might have looked something like this guy, nicknamed duckbill dinosaur because the front of the snout looks a little bit like a duck's bill, but don't take that to be too literally to mean that it lived like a duck or quacked like a duck, nothing like that. So in the 1990s, Guy Darrow and myself, with some help from a, a team of volunteers, created the Missouri Ozark Dinosaur Project. And we wanted to do a very detailed scientific excavation of the site. And so in 1998, we started excavating within a, an enclosure. Why? Because all of the excavations that Dr. Stinchcomb did became frog ponds. The clay is very resistant to water moving through it, so it, it just fills up with water and stays filled up with water. So we didn't want to have to deal with that. So a guy uh, got a, a grant from the St. Louis uh, Science Center. They gave him the money to buy a greenhouse. And the greenhouse is pretty substantial. This is one of our wonderful volunteers, the amazing Mr. Teeters, as I like to call him. Uh, he lives down in Marble Hill nearby. and he, he was kept an eye on the place, did a lot of work for us, and just an all-around great guy. That's the, that's the enclosure. It's essentially roughly 20 by 36, something like that. And uh, this is the house. We spiffed it up. It looks a lot nicer than in the previous picture. We used this as a bunkhouse. Inside the greenhouse, uh, Tom Schussler from Jefferson College uh, built for us a 60 square meeting, sorry, 60 square meter grid for mapping because if you're doing a proper scientific excavation, you're supposed to map where everything is so you can reconstruct important information from that. And so that's our hanging grid. And then we use that to line up this small portable grid that's one square meter in order to map. And this is one of my maps. In fact, that's a turtle being mapped there. I got sick of mapping turtles. <laughs> I said, you know, to heck with the turtles full speed ahead. This is one of our quarry maps. So we, re we map things in very great detail. This is a series of tailbones. That's one there. There's another one and a third one. And I, named the, I nicknamed the Molary and Curly. <laughs> and then we got some other tailbones nearby. And we also measured the depth. This is the largest vertebra that we've found so far. It's as big as the biggest ones from the original dig. And it, it's about that big. It's big. I'll show you another picture of it later. So we're being very careful to, to document everything, both with mapping and photography. And this is not the easiest deposit to dig in. I sometimes call it the clay from hell because there are parts of it that are just full of rocks. That's a rock pebble, and there's another one. 
and here's another one here and another one there and, another. and when you're trying to dig and you hit that boy it's just frustrating and then we've got dinosaur bones scattered in amongst this stuff so here's part of a tail here and here's three of them that are almost lined up who knows those trays three of them and then there's some really big rocks in this deposit. That's a limestone boulder. That's not a plaster jacketed specimen. That's a, a weathered limestone boulder. And it's a lot bigger than that now. We excavated out around, it just keeps getting bigger. <laughs> so there's some really big rocks in there. And it's always been a bit of a puzzlement as to how those got there. I think there may have been a, a basically a kind of a landslide, a debris flow, mud flow kind of thing uh, into the, the body of water. Now, excavation of a major find. What happens when you find something really good and you want to be sure to get it out intact? Uh, this is Dr. Paris in the early 2000s helping us excavate out around a partial skeleton. We actually found part of a skeleton. And there it is. So first thing you got to do is dig all around it, isolate it on a block. And what you're looking at here, this is a vertebra. And here's another one. And there's another one underneath of it. And then this is the shoulder blade, and some of the other bones from the front leg are over here. So we wanted to try and take that out as, as, a, as a unit, as a, in a block. Not easy to do. So first you've got a trench all the way around it. That's a close-up of some of the bones. It's just really densely packed. This was the hard part. That's right up against the wall of the excavation, so I had to kind of lay on my side and try and dig with that little trowel there. It was not easy work. And again, that's the shoulder blade there, several vertebra, probably neck vertebra. And then we plaster jacketed it. Now, why would we do that? Well, to protect it. You want to make sure that the bones don't get damaged as it's being transported. So we uh, put strips of cloth around it, and it's soaked in plaster, like, like a plaster cast. If somebody breaks their arm or breaks their leg, similar thing. Then we had to figure out, how are we going to get that sucker out of the excavation? So <coughs> we lifted it up. We put it on a pallet. We built a ramp so that we could pull it up out of the excavation because this thing's way too heavy for anybody to lift. We actually did weigh the pallet plus this at the co-op. weighs over 900 pounds. So they built a ramp and they attached a cable to it, ran the cable outside to Bill Teeter's pickup truck. And in our first attempt to pull the ramp, the entire ramps started coming up out of the excavation. So he said, stop, stop. <laughs> and we put these braces. <laughs> so the second time it worked. We got it all the way up out of the hole, and then we had to pull it then to the out, outside of, the, ex of the, uh, the greenhouse, and then we had to pull it back up into the back of the pickup truck using a come along. So getting big specimens out is rather a lot of logistical nightmares sometimes. That's the biggest thing we ever tried to remove. And we nicknamed it Gargantua, not because the dinosaur itself was big, but because it's the biggest thing we ever took out of the excavation, most difficult to move. Now, what sorts of creatures have been documented at the site? What sort of things were romping about down in southeastern Missouri 75 million years ago? Well, let's take a look at the dinosaurs. The most, most of the fossils that we find of dinosaurs are from this kind of a beast, a hadrosaur, a duckbill dinosaur. This one is uh, in the insurance business, Aflac. <laughs> um, here's another one called Critosaurus, which may be uh, related to our Missouri dinosaur. We don't know for sure that it, it had that kind of a snout because we don't have that part of the skull. But Dr. John Horner, who's an expert on duckbill dinosaurs, has looked at some of our skull fossils and says it reminds him of a beast called Gryposaurus. And Gryposaurus looks a lot like that. So we'll, if we, as we get new fossils, we may have to revise our idea. That's part of the hip, part of the pelvis, called the ischium. That's the largest, I think, single bone that we've found. It's in bad shape. It's badly crushed and mangled. You know, that's unfortunately not too uncommon with dinosaur remains. Uh, this is that large tailbone that I told you about, the biggest one that we've found. Uh, in fact, Guy's wife, Doris, is the one who found this. And it was split in two. There was a fault running through it. It's really weird. So this has been re-glued re back together again. So that's, that's the largest vertebra that we have from very close to the hip. That's Molarian curly I showed you in the map of earlier. They're pretty good sized tailbones with the uh, 
the process, what's called the dorsal process, is still there, which is most of the time broken off. So this part of the vertebrae is kind of fragile and often gets broken away from the rest of the tailbone, but that's still there. This is from the very tip of the tail, where the vertebrae get, actually get fused together. So I, I nicknamed that one knuckles, because it kind of looks like a knuckle. Now, this from our site. Oh, I wish it was. But see these things? Duckbill dinosaurs and a number of other kinds of ornithischian dinosaurs, and even some of the meat eaters, had stiffening rods that run along the tail so that the tail, instead of being real slack and dragging on the ground, would actually stick out in back, and that would help to, as a balancing pole to balance the front of the end of the animal. So those are called ossified tendons. They've been turned into bone. So they're not what, you know, tendons are normally made of a cartilaginous material, but these have actually been turned into bone. And those are those processes on the vertebrae. Well, this is a bundle of ossified tendons from our Missouri dinosaur site. And the whole thing goes on for about a meter, about three feet. And this is a fragment from a rib, which I actually brought that fossil in so people can take a look at it. Show an actual size here. And the interesting thing is this is still original bone. It's not been filled in with minerals or replaced. It's still the original bone. But that also means it's very fragile. Now, the most exciting thing that we found is bits of the skull, because that helps you to determine what kind of dinosaur you're dealing with. It's the skull that gives you the most information about who it's related to and how it fed and that sort of thing. And by the way, our dinosaur is now referred to as Hypsobema missouriense. But that could change. <clears throat> so this is part of the lower left jaw. This is the inside of the jaw. So the tongue would have been in the same general area. And these are teeth. And of course, this has also been crushed and distorted. But these are not the teeth of a meat-eating dinosaur. These are the teeth of a plant-eating dinosaur. This is not from our site. I wish it was. But this one shows a perfect example of what this is a partial of. So this is the left jaw of a duckbill dinosaur. And so you can see lots and lots of teeth there. As the teeth on the top wear out, the ones underneath of them take their place. We only get two sets of teeth in our life, but dinosaurs were constantly replacing their teeth throughout their lifetime. And this is a, an artist's rendering of this, kind of emphasizing so you can see a little better the the rows and rows of teeth. This is called a dental battery. That's the actual grinding surface right there. They have anywhere from three to five rows of teeth packed very closely together, and it forms a grinding surface, like a grist mill. So these guys actually chewed their food. Most dinosaurs didn't. But uh, hadrosaurs had very sophisticated tooth structures that could grind stuff in between the upper jaw and the lower jaw, grind it into a pulp before they swallowed it. And that's another view. That's, that's a tooth that's actually started to, to have wear on it. It's flattened down. These haven't yet started to be used, so they're still kind of pointy looking. But so that's a grinding surface there. Ours is, you know, missing a lot of bits, unlike the, the one in the picture here, which is pretty much almost complete. Ours is a partial. That's an outside view, outside the jaw view of the uh, lower left dentary. And this is the front part of the left jaw, the lower jaw. There's missing bits in between. And this is from behind the dentary. This is called the serangular bone. And this is a cheekbone called the jugal. So these are all parts of the skull. And then I superimposed photographic images of these bones on the skull of Gryposaurus because Dr. Horner thought that that's what our beast was related to. So there's the dentary, the, the lower jaw. Here's the part with the teeth. This is the front part, which doesn't have any teeth. We all, there's the cheekbone, jugal, and then there's the serangular, which is behind that. So the, we've got other pieces, but we haven't been able to figure out where they're from in the skull yet. So all told, with all the different fossils that have been found at the site, everything that's shown in yellow there is a part of the beast that we found fossils of. So we've got parts of the skull. We've got the atlas bone. We have neck vertebra and neck ribs. We have the shoulder blade. We have the coracoid. We have 
bones from the radius and the ulna from the front leg. We have finger bones, we got the toe bones, we got the shin bone, we got part of a femur, and that's that part of the pelvis that I showed you earlier, and tail bones, some close to the hip, some about midway, and some at the very end, or near the end. So we don't have a whole beast, and we're filling in the bits as time goes on, but that's, that's still pretty good for Missouri. Now, not all the dinosaur bones that we find are from plant-eating duckbill dinosaurs. We also have some of the guys that ate them. We have theropod or uh, meat-eating dinosaurs. And one of the ones that we found some remains of is a relative of Tyrannosaurus. This is part of one of the legs of a Tyrannosaurus, and I don't know it any more specifically than that. Uh, and notice, that's the marrow cavity. Still perfectly preserved. No minerals filling it in. And one of the reasons that we think this is from a meat-eating dinosaur is how thick that bone is. Uh, carnosaurs or theropods tend to have really thick leg bones because their food fights back. So they need to have strong bones. This is a tooth, the whole tooth, and not the tooth, from the Tyrannosaurus. I have a plaster cast of that here. It is not a big fossil. That's a quarter there. That's the actual size of it, but it's just a plaster cast. So we had a relative of T. rex, although that's about as much as we know about it. We don't have much of it. And this was interesting. This tooth Guy found on a spoils pile. We assumed it was from a baby of the T. rex type. Now, by, by the way, our deposit is too old to have Tyrannosaurus rex in it, but it, there were relatives of T. rex that were living at the time that our site was with. So we thought this was from a juvenile. We showed this to Dr. Phil Curry from the Royal Tyrrell Museum, who's an expert on meat-eating dinosaurs, and he immediately straightened us out. He said, no, that's not a T-Rex tooth or any relative of T-Rex. He said, that's a raptor, Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. We had a relative of Velociraptor running around down in, in southeast Missouri 75 million years ago. So we had raptors here. However, Thanks to Jurassic Park, people think raptors were a lot bigger, at least Velociraptor. They think it's a lot bigger than it actually was. That's a reconstruction of Velociraptor. So what? Feathers? Yes, there should have been feathers on them in Jurassic World. We now know that raptors had feathers. They were very birdy. But they stubbornly refused to put the feathers on them in this latest movie, which ticked a lot of us off. Because we, they could have easily rationalized that. They could have said, well, you know, we had to fill in a whole bunch of the DNA with frog DNA. Well, now we got more complete DNA, and so we now know that they had feathers or whatever. Oh, well, anyway, they didn't, so they still have naked uh, dromaeosaurs. But these guys aren't as big as they are in the movies. That's the actual size of Velociraptor compared to a human being, about the size of a turkey. The ones in the Jurassic Park movies would actually be Deinonychus or something like that. But, oh well, at any rate, so they're not as big as the ones in the movie, but there were raptors as big as the ones in the movie. They just aren't Velociraptor. Now, so those are the three dinosaurs that we've documented so far. We're hoping to find other kinds of dinosaurs, but so far those are the three. And for the raptor, it's that one single tooth. That's it. That's all we have of it. So it's very sketchy. Uh, Non-dinosaur animals, just to mention some of the other critters that we find fossils of. Turtles! <laughs> Boy, the most common fossils that we find are pieces of turtle shell. And you get sick of it after a while because you want to find the dinosaurs, but I have to map everything, so I end up mapping all those turtles. So this is a turtle still in the clay, and this is part of the, the top part of the shell, the carapace. It's broken up a little bit, but it, uh, with a little work, you can put the pieces back together. Now, the next picture I'm going to show you is not this turtle, but another one that had over 200 pieces, and this was as many of them as I could get back together. So you're looking down on top of the shell here. And that's another, this one you can see a little better. That's the edge, the edge of the turtle shell, and there's the top of the turtle shell. There's lots of it missing. And another turtle that we find is a very weird one. It is not a water turtle. This guy is a turtle that lived in the, in the water. It's an aquatic turtle. This is a tortoise with the funkiest looking shell it has these little beads all over the surface of it. 
And these are called, guess what? Beaded turtles is the nickname for them. And these are tortoises, and they're big. So this was a land turtle. And I've often wondered what the function of these beads were. I like to joke that the dinosaurs used them as floor mats to wipe the mud off of their feet. I'm joking, of course. This is, so th this is a piece of the bottom of the turtle. This is a piece of the top. And again, you can see all those little beads. Lots of times they break off, but there's still some on here. So that's why it's called beaded turtle. These are extinct. There are no turtles like this anymore, or tortoises, to be exact. And these also, these guys were spiky. These things were apparently embedded in their legs. This has something like, I think, at least five different spiky points on it, maybe seven. So I like to joke that this is kind of a Klingon turtle. Another thing that we find fossils of are crocodilians, relatives of the crocodiles and the alligators of today. And this is one of the types of fossils we find. I know it kind of looks like a, a biscuit or something, but that's a bony armor plate from the back. See, modern crocodiles and alligators have bony plates embedded in their skin, in their back. So that's what these are. They're called dermal armor scoots. This is part of the skull of a crocodile. And I was rather surprised when Barbara Branstaff identified it as such, because I thought it was from something much smaller. But this is called the splenial, and it's from the lower jaw. So that's another crocodile fossil. And there's even tinier things than that. A uh, guy looks through the samples to pick out itty bitty microfossils. These are some of the things we found. Teeth from baby crocodiles. Uh, we have fossils of a creature called Habrosaurus. It's a funky amphibian that doesn't have any hind legs. It only has front legs. And it's several feet long, I unfortunately don't have a picture of any of the fossils, but uh, we have a modern relative of this guy that lives in southeast Missouri, in Missouri, in our rivers. It's called the Cyrenian. So that's the front legs, no hind legs. And those are the gills. And froggies. We find some fossil bones that apparently are from frogs. We don't know the genus and species, but we did have some. And then you kind of expect a lake would have some froggies. In fact, that pretty much indicates more likely to be uh, a standing body of water. And fishes. Garpike. Now, today, garpikes are in our Missouri rivers, the Mississippi and Missouri and so forth, and they're nasty. A lot of fishermen, they catch one of these things, they cut the lines. I'm not messing with that, because look at that long row of nasty, sharp teeth. So we find fossils from gar. Uh, these are teeth, gar-type teeth. And that's a scale from uh, the scaly back of a, of a gar pike, pretty small one there. Bowfin, which also are found today in Missouri. It's, and both gar pike and bowfin are kind of primitive fish. They're kind of an intermediate stage of, of bony fishes. And that's a tooth probably from a bowfin or some related amiad. And this is some vertebrae, a backbone from a fishy. Pretty big one, actually, for a fish. And then some other ones that we have had identified by fish experts. These are teeth from a type of fish that I hadn't even heard of before called the bone fish. Again, these are very tiny. You need a microscope to see them properly. And this guy is called hydrotus. And these are teeth from, uh, that, that these guys use to crush shells. So they feed on shellfish. And these are from the back of the throat. They're called pharyngeal teeth from Hydrotus, and we have some cartilaginous fishes. Uh, for example, freshwater shark, uh, Hydrotus, which again, I don't have any pictures of the fossils, but that's a reconstruction of what Hydrotus would have looked like. And some relative of the stingray. Barbara Grandstaff identified something as a tooth from one of these kind of guys. And again, I don't have a picture of the fossil, unfortunately. Now. A dinosaur needs to have a home, and our Missouri dinosaur does indeed have a home. The Bollinger County Museum of Natural History. This is a very new institution. It was created in the early 2000s. I've got flyers right here for anyone that's interested. And that's the logo of the, uh, the museum. That's the building. It used to be a community college back in the 20s and 30s, and it went bankrupt. 
and the town was desperate to find something, some good use to put it to. And so Guy Darrow was put in touch with the movers and shakers in Marble Hill, and it became the Bollinger County Museum of Natural History. So it's a three-story, substantial building. That's the museum director, Ava Dunn. That's Guy, who was the curator of the museum. And we've got some really first-rate displays here. If you want to learn more about the Missouri dinosaur, these are plaster replicas of the original bones. The, the, the originals are in the Smithsonian. But these are plaster casts from them, showing the, the tail and the original idea that it was a sauropod. Then the next display case shows our new ideas about it being a duckbill dinosaur. And these are all actual fossils here. These are those toe bones I was telling you about. And that uh, tyrannosaurid tooth is right there. And there's the toe bones. And this shows which one of the toes these come from. And so this is from the tip of the middle toe of the left foot. This would be from way up here in that part of that toe. And then this would be kind of in the middle of, of that toe. And in the mid-2000s, our dinosaur became official, the Missouri State Dinosaur. Yes, we have a state dinosaur, Hypsobema missouriense. And that's because the Speaker of the House at that time, Rod Jetton, was from Marble Hill. So Guy prodded him to have it uh, made the official state dinosaur. There's one rendering. This is a life-size model of our state dinosaur on display on the second floor of the museum. And the, the local kids had a contest. They named it Dinah Mo. <laughs> Dinah, yeah, it's bad. I call it Lucia because she's got a Roman nose. And it's obviously a female because she's guarding her eggs. So I call her Lucia. But this part of the skull may not actually look like that. We hopefully will find out more about that in the future. So here we see our, remember the plaster jacketed specimen that was so difficult to get out of the excavation? Here it is arriving at the museum in its plaster jacket. And here it is in the preparation room. There's Guy and myself and one of our volunteers, Tony Sola. Great name for a detective, I think. And here I am in what I call the bone zone. And the bones are very fragile, so instead of using steel implements, I'm actually using skewers. I've been sharpened in a pencil sharpener, so I don't damage the bone. And a skeleton is emerging. So here we see the shoulder blade. These are parts that link one backbone to another. And that's an actual vertebra there. And that's, I've highlighted so you can see it better. That's the shoulder blade. And there's another vertebra underneath that. Those little things sticking out are part of the vertebra. And then there's the whole slab. So over here, we've got the part of the front leg, the radius and ulna. Here's the shoulder blade, the scapula. That's a cervical rib and dorsal rib over there. And then we've got all kinds of bits of backbones from the neck. I'm pretty sure those are neck vertebrae. And then over here is part of the shoulder assembly, too, called the coracoid. Now, because this was taken out in a hurry. Why did we take it out in a hurry? Because another fossil nearby had been vandalized. Someone broke into our excavation and damaged that skull. I spent two years putting pieces of that skull back together again. I named it Humpty Dumpty. So Guy was nervous about leaving this partial skeleton in the excavation long enough for me to completely map it. So I've been having to map it a little bit at a time. I have to drive down to Marble Hill to the museum. And I, this is a device that I invented and the, our machinist at the physics department at University of Missouri-St. Louis built this for me. And so I, I map points from two fixed points, the distance, and then I have to plot it. And so I have been plotting hundreds of individual data points to create that. It's nearly complete. I've been working on this now for over five years, I think. Uh, it's only relatively recently that I had that nice gizmo. I was having to do it with a tape measure before that, and it didn't work well. So there's, this, is, this is the shoulder blade. And these are bones from the front leg here. And then lots of vertebrae, some of them sitting literally on top of one another. This is another part of the shoulder assembly called the coracoid. And this is a, a vertebra that's been crushed flat like a beer can. If you laid a beer can down like that and crushed it. So that's pretty interesting. 
Now, in 2008, we had a film crew come down to the Chronister site from uh, Flight 33 Productions. They were doing a series of programs for the Discovery Channel, each one based around a different city in the United States. And the one they were working on at this time was called Prehistoric Chicago. And they wanted to make the case that there could have been dinosaurs in Chicago. Well, they didn't really need our site to do that. Any place that was above sea level had dinosaurs in the dinosaur age. They've even been found in Antarctica. But they wanted to show that dinosaurs had been found in Missouri, even if they hadn't been found in Illinois, to make the case that there would have been dinosaurs romping about in what is today Chicago. So we had our 15 minutes of fame. That's Guy. That's me. And that's the show. So they actually, and they, it's lucky they came down when they did, because just a, a, a couple of months after they visited to film all that, disaster struck. In January of 2009, a horrific ice storm went through southeastern Missouri and northern Arkansas and flattened our greenhouse. That was the last thing I would ever have expected. I thought maybe a tree would fall on it or something, but no. The ice literally collapsed it. It's heartbreaking, really. And Guy has a new greenhouse, and he says we're going to put it up and replace this one, maybe this year. I'll wait and see. So nothing more has been excavated from that site since uh, October of 2008 when that film crew came down, because this happened shortly after that. So a new and bigger greenhouse is planned to replace it, and so new discoveries await in the future, hopefully. Now I've got some replicas up here. These are, this are replicas of tail vertebrae, so they're not actual fossils. This is a replica of the Tyrannosaurid tooth. I have a replica of the raptor tooth here, and a plaster cast of one of those bony plates from a crocodile. But I have an actual real dinosaur fossil from the site. This is part of a rib. This would be where the rib would attach to the backbone. So there's a big section of it missing, but it's a partial one. It was in a lot of pieces. It took a long time to put all that back together. So with that, we've come to the end of